Uh, grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we'll be this morning. If you want to use the Bibles and the pews in front of you there, you can find it on page 856, uh, I believe, 856, 1 Corinthians 15. A number of years ago, there was a uh, report done on a Kansas City uh, pharmacist named Robert Courtney. Uh, he was convicted of diluting cancer medications for profit. Guy made over $19 million in profit in doing this. And uh, over a period of about nine years, he had diluted some 98,000 prescriptions that affected around 4,200 patients. And 17 of those had died because their cancer medications had been diluted by this man who wanted to make a profit. Here was a man who was entrusted with the responsibility of um, healing uh, and handing out this life-saving medication, but he had diluted it to the point where it had lost its effectiveness and it couldn't save lives anymore. And as tragic as that story sounds, there's a part of me that wonders if maybe the same thing is happening in some of our churches today where we're diluting the message of God so much that it's lost its effectiveness. We've been entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ that brings healing and salvation. Have we diluted the Scriptures? Have we diluted that so much? Have we softened the Scriptures so much that we've lost our impact for the kingdom of God to heal and to save lives. I hope we haven't. I think, Barbara, in First Church of Christ, we preach the Word, I hope, I think. Well, in chapter 15, Paul's writing this letter, remember, to the church of Corinth for a couple of reasons. One, he wants to restore unity to the church. Two, he's answering some of their questions about what they should believe and how they should act and that kind of thing. Well, in chapter 15, Paul has to remind the Corinthian church why they exist, what they're all about, what the primary purpose is. And too many Christians in their church have fallen for a watered-down version, a diluted version of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of false teachers that had infiltrated their church and had started teaching some of these shallow ways of living. Some shallow teaching was going on there. And again, if we're going to have unity and harmony within the church today, we must be careful not to fall into the same trap. So we're going to talk about growing deeper from this shallow teaching to having doctrinal period, purity, not just in the church, but within our own lives. So today we're going to specifically look at the church and what that looks like in our context. Uh, but what does that look like in our own lives even is a question I hope you'll take with you. Uh, I hope you'll take notes there in your bulletins there on the back side is a place to take notes, fill in some blanks, message notes there on the back. I've left some, some blanks for you to fill in. I'm going to be honest, we're going to move really quickly through these 10 questions that we're going to ask to, to spot a doctrinally pure church and what that looks like. So we're going to jump right in, try to keep up. I'll have you underline some phrases. Let's go right to verse 1 of chapter 15. Now, brothers, stop there. <laughs> underline that word, brothers, brothers. We know when I was growing up in the church, uh, I always thought it was weird. I remember asking my dad, why do, why do they call so-and-so brother Timothy and brother this and brother that? What's, what's the deal with that? Sister this and sister that. And he explained to me, well, that's what we call each other in the church. We're brothers and sisters. And if you've never grown up with that, you might think that's kind of weird and creepy. Why would I call brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so? But the idea is that there is a relationship within the church that is especially close with each other because of the, of the common commitment we have to Jesus Christ. He makes us family. We're all family. Isn't that great? Man, you thought you had this tiny little... No, no, we're all family. I got a hundred and some different brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ right here in the Barber and Church of Christ. We're all family. So the question that needs to be asked that we draw right out of this first verse is this. Is the fellowship, how do I identify a doctrinally pure church? Is the fellowship, is what we have in common, is it a common commitment, is it based on a common commitment to Jesus Christ and His Word? Is there a common commitment that we have to Jesus Christ and His Word? Here at First Church of Christ, we are committed to Jesus and His Word. It's what we 
base everything we do on. Uh, in class 101, if you haven't taken class 101 yet, I encourage you to do so next time it's offered. But in class 101, those of you who have been through it, you know, I ask our participants as we go through, we actually talk about our statement of faith and we talk about our core values that we hold dear here at First Church of Christ. We talk about those things and those things are based on Jesus and His Word. We didn't just draw these up somehow. And what we ask our participants to do is basically agree with these documents, the statement of faith and this, uh, these core values, because they, are, they serve as a guide right out of the scriptures of how we should conduct our Christian lives. It's, a, it's that important to us. We have a common commitment to Jesus and His words, and we ask the class to agree to and abide by those statements. <clears throat> so far, I haven't had any one dissent. That's pretty good. Why? Because it's based on Jesus and His word. Okay. Paul continues on in verse 1. Let's continue on. He says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Now, underline this word remind. This is very important that we remind each other. The question to ask here is, is there a continued emphasis on the essentials? Is there a continued emphasis on the essentials? You know what I find interesting about the Apostle Paul throughout his letters? He does this quite a bit. He kind of comes back to the essentials of Christianity and how we're to be living. He kind of repeats himself. And some of you, when you come to church here on Sunday mornings, you might think, holy mackerel, it seems like they're just repeating themselves so much. Guess what? We are. Because it's that important that we get the essentials of Christianity, that we get the essentials of Jesus Christ, and we get it ingrained into our minds. Paul was the same way. He was not, he, he did it on purpose. We have, we have uh, in, in uh, chapter 2, uh, back in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, he says, I resolved to know, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, I wonder how many times he preached that message. Probably quite a bit. He wanted to make sure the people got it, that this was an essential. It was so essential that you have to have it ingrained in your minds. In today's world, we have so many distractions when you really think about it. You know, we have, we have our iPads, our tablets, our, we have our uh, video games, and we have our television. You think about television, and what a big distraction that is, and the influence it has in our lives today when you really think about television do you know the average, today, the average American family turns on the television, on average, every day, seven hours and 55 minutes? That's a lot of television. Almost eight hours a day watching television, and I think, we can't go to church for one hour on Sunday morning? Like, what's the deal? We, don't, we can't spend 15 minutes in the gospel of Jesus? No, but we can watch television for eight hours. But think about the impact that has, has on people's lives, the influence that television has on people's lives. I read a study done a few years ago by the American Family of Pediatrics. Uh, for a period of two years, they studied adolescents ages uh, 12 to 14 years old. There are just over 1,000 of these adolescents they studied, 12 to 14 years old. They found that the teens who were exposed to high amounts of sexual media, whether it be through television or anything else, they were 220% more likely to have sexual intercourse between the ages of 14 and 16 than those who had limited exposure. You think media has an influence, an impact on the way we think and the way we act? Oh, you better believe it. What we're commonly exposed to ends up becoming our doctrine. It becomes our worldview. Whatever's up here comes out in our action. I told our class, one, our class 201 participants last Sunday night, I said, oh, we, become, we become what we think about most. It's true. Whatever we think about the most, that's what we become. So we, yeah, it sounds like we repeat ourselves quite a bit, right? <laughs> there, that's on purpose. We have to keep an emphasis on the essentials of Christianity. All right, Paul continues. It says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Underline that phrase, taken your stand. Listen, doctrin doctrinal purity isn't just about the information being taught. 
It's not, it's not just engaging the mind, but it's engaging the heart, and then finally the will, so that it cause, causes you to take a stand for Jesus Christ. The question to ask here is, essentially, does the message uh, uh, challenge me personally? So if I'm going to find a doctrinally pure church, I want to know, is there something in the content of the message that I'm getting from this church? Is, is it going to challenge me to do something for Jesus Christ? Hebrews 4.12 says that the Bible is uh, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the soul and spirit. In other words, it, it, it impacts us in a personal way. It's that deep that it can challenge me to do something for Jesus Christ. So our goal every here at uh, at uh, every Sunday here at First Church of Christ, our goal is that the Holy Spirit would challenge you to live a better life. That the Holy Spirit, I pray it every weekend, oh, God, please just let your Holy Spirit speak through me and speak to every person in this crowd. Use me as your instrument to do that. And that's why we ask those two questions at the bottom of your outlines, right? First question is what? What's God saying? Second question is, what am I going to do about it? All right, this is why we're here. All right, God, I'm, I'm expecting, I anticipate God's going to say something to me in this worship service. I'm going to put that in my mind. I'm going to try to figure out what can I do about that? How can I change my life? How can I transform my life for Jesus Christ? How can I renew my mind so much that I'm going to live my life every single day for Jesus Christ? There's something that has to challenge me. So our goal isn't just to transfer a bunch of information to you. That's old school. We're not here just to get up and give you a Greek lesson on whatever. No, we want to challenge you to transform. It's about bringing transformation to your life. That's the goal. Does it challenge me personally? Verse 2 now. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Underline this word gospel. This is so huge, gospel. And there's a lot of cool stuff in this verse. It's packed with so much I wish I had, I wish I had the time to just unload it for you. But anyway... Uh, gospel means good news, right? The question here to ask then is the message presented as good news. Is the good news of Jesus Christ being presented in the message week in and week out? How can I spot a doctrinally pure church? The church should be a place where we celebrate God's grace in our lives. Some of you were celebrating that this morning. All those songs we sang this morning, man, well, that, was, that was God's grace. He sent His Son to die for us out of His grace. So we did nothing to save ourselves. God did it through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. Is that what's being celebrated and explored? I want to point something out about salvation here. He says, um, by this gospel you are saved. In the original language, this word saved is not in the past tense. <laughs> it's actually in the present tense, and it really should be translated, by this, by this gospel you are being saved. You are being saved. It's not a one-time event that happens in your life. Uh, salvation isn't something that's ever completed in this world. People ask me all the time, Jeremy, when did you, you get saved? I love that question. I, I don't know what they mean. I don't know what they mean, but I usually come back with a smart comment like, well, am I in heaven yet? <laughs> That's the completion of my salvation. I am constantly being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ every single day. Thank you. And I'm working it out every single day. Yes, I was saved when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I was saved when I went into the baptistry and got baptized and my sins were washed away. I was saved, but I am being saved today from all my sins. And guess what? I will be saved in heaven when I walk through those pearly gates someday. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's grace. That's grace. Through God's grace, we're being saved every day. That's what brings the church together in, hum in unity and harmony. All right? Next, underline this phrase, hold firmly. Hold firmly. Uh, the question here is, is the call of the message to not just believe, but actually to do something, to follow, to get engaged? Doctrinal purity does more than just call someone to listen and believe. It's not a passive thing. It calls us to respond and to follow, to get involved. 
That's one of the reasons we offer an invitation every Sunday morning. The gospel should be that, that impactful, that, that amazing that we respond to it and we do something about it. It's not just about believing, it's about doing. Does, does it uh, ask me to follow? Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now underline this phrase, what I received. This is very important, folks, that you get this because the question that needs to be asked is, is the message being delivered by a genuine and authentic messenger? This is so important because we can get so easily caught up in in those preachers and those teachers who tickle our ears. Those preachers and teachers that don't really challenge us, but they give us the fluff. It's so easy to get caught up in those preachers who make you feel good and preach only what you want to hear. And there's something wrong with that. A lot of times there's no substance to what they're saying. A lot of times they're, what they're saying actually could do you worse and end up destroying you. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Check this out. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They're going to tear you apart. How do you know them? By their fruit, what they produce. It's who preachers are that really matters. It's who they are. That's why when you read Paul and his letters in the New Testament, that's why he constantly, as he preaches and teaches and writes his letters, he gives us windows into his personal life and how it's been impacted and changed and transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's real to the Apostle Paul. He tells the the people all the time, man, I used to be like this, but Jesus came into my life, now I'm like this. And you should be the same way. You should do the same things. Otherwise, it's like going to, a, going to a dealership to buy a car, <laughs> and the salesman goes on and on how you should buy this American-made car, and he's finally got you convinced, and you're like, you're signing on the dotted line to buy this American-made car, and you're so excited about it, and you look out the window, and you see this, that same salesman driving off in a Toyota. There's something wrong with that. Beware of those kind of teachers, Jesus says of those preachers, one of my prayers, one of my commitments to you is that I'll never get up here and preach something that I myself have not struggled with and not just really got into and go, okay, I need to work on this. I will not get up here and ask you to do something that I'm not willing to work on myself. That's my commitment to you. And I give it to you straight. I'm working on it too. I'm not perfect. But I've been saved by Jesus Christ. We're in this together as we try to live our lives for Jesus Christ. Uh, Underline then now uh, a first importance there in verse 3. First importance. This, if we were putting these questions in order uh, of priority, this would probably be the first question we would ask. It would be top priority. And that question is, is the primary focus consistently Jesus? Is it Jesus that we're focused on here, or is it somebody else or something else? Okay, you've got to be careful. If you've been coming to church here for any period of time, I don't care if it was just today, it's pretty obvious we focus on Jesus, isn't it? All the songs we sang this morning, man, that's, that's Jesus. It's in our name, you know, First Church of Christ. Um, our focus every week is, is Jesus. I'm telling you, there are churches out there that that's not it. Their focus isn't on Jesus In fact, they will preach and teach, and a lot of times it's about the preacher himself. You can go on and watch, go online and watch some of these guys. They talk about themselves quite a bit. They might sprinkle in a dose of God, and very rarely will they talk about Jesus. That's scary. That is really scary. There's no focus on Jesus. Uh, But anyway, Paul says this has to be of first importance, that we focus on Jesus, that everything points to Him. That we pray, I pray it every week. Help us to point everyone to Jesus Christ. It's not about a person up here. It's about Jesus. And then he gives us this gospel message, right? Verse 3, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, it's all about Jesus. This is of first importance, Paul says. This is what brings the church together in harmony and unity. 
It's not what we wear on Sunday mornings. It's not the songs that we sing or where we hang the cross or where we put the communion table. It's not the color of the walls or whether we have chairs or pews. It's not about who's on the music team or who opens the doors for people when they come into the church building. No, it's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's of first importance. Everything else is fluff. So you've got to underline this next phrase, according to the Scriptures. And we talked about this one last week. Um, it's worth repeating here. That the question that should be asked is, is the message based on the Bible? Is the message based on the Bible? This is so important. Again, I'm afraid a lot of churches, they've watered down the gospel, they've watered down the Scriptures so much that you don't even know the Bible was used on Sunday morning. This, there should never be an exception to this. Every message that's delivered should have at its foundation the gospel, the Bible of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Without the Word of God as our foundation, we have no, nothing worthwhile to say. We're just wasting your time. Might as well just sing a couple songs and go home. Paul says to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, preach the Word. Preach the Word. And that's our commitment that we would preach the Word. And you know, it may be uncomfortable. <laughs> you ever feel uncomfortable? Like, man, my toes got stepped on. But we're going to preach the Word. It may not be popular, but we're going to preach the Word. It may not be politically correct, but we're going to preach the Word. Someday free speech may be redefined, and they may, they may tell us that we're not allowed to preach from certain Scriptures of the Bible, but guess what? We're going to preach the Word. We're going to do it. Jump down to verse 9. He says, I am the least of the apostles and, even, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You feel Paul's brokenness here? I don't even deserve to be doing this because of what I used to do. He's the least of the, of the apostles. The question you need to ask is, is the message taught with a spirit of humility and brokenness? Has the person really come to grips with who they are? And you should beware of preachers who don't realize how sinful they are. Paul calls himself the worst of all sinners, and he was. He, he says he was a blasphemer. You know blasphemy, the, the one sin that could send you to hell for all of eternity? Paul calls himself a blasphemer. Because that's what he did before he became a Christian. He was out blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ and he was putting Christians in, into jail. He was killing them. The worst of all sinners. He came to grips with who he was. Be careful of preachers who think they're doing God a favor by preaching and teaching. It's about God's grace, right? Look at verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. He says, no, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Underline that phrase, grace of God. Man, this is huge. The question really comes down to, is it all about grace? Does it come down to grace? Does it come down to grace? C.S. Lewis was uh, at, a, at a conference, a British conference one time on comparative religions. And uh, there was this breakout session that C.S. Lewis had not been a part of at the beginning of it, uh, but the people were starting to, be, to debate whether or not there was something in Christianity that made it different, uh, unique from all other religions. So they're talking. They begin eliminating the possibilities. Incarnation, well, you know, other religions, they have these different versions of gods appearing in human form, so not really. Resurrection, well, you know, you have other religions that... They have accounts of returns of, of uh, people that come back from death, reincarnation, that kind of thing, right? So uh, it kind of went down the line. Well, the debate went on and on. It got kind of heated, and C.S. Lewis wandered into the room, and he says, man, what's all the ruckus about? And his colleagues, of course, posed the question to him. We're discussing, is there anything unique about the Christian faith? And C.S. Lewis laughed, and he simply said, well, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. And when you think about it, all the other religions in the world, they don't offer grace. No other religion teaches the God of grace where His love for us is unconditional. His gift of salvation is free 
through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. No other religion teaches that. You have to work for it. So, the last question I have for you as we kind of wrap this up is, have you responded to the true doctrine? Have you landed in a place where you go, yep, Jesus is mine, and that's what matters, and I'm going to focus on that? Are you doctrinally pure? Anyone here, I'm kind of curious, anyone here own a Rolex watch? Kind of put your hand up if you're kind of embarrassed about that. <laughs> all right, I don't see any hands. That's all right. I was doing a little bit of research on Rolex watches last week, and I don't own one myself, but uh, do you know how to tell? Anyone know how to tell a real Rolex from a fake Rolex? Huh? Yeah. That is one of the things. Yeah, the secondhand sweeps on a real Rolex, it doesn't tick. Uh, I, I had to do some, do some research. I came up, I found this article, t- 10 ways you can tell a real Rolex from a fake Rolex. Uh, and it lists things like a, R- a Rolex watch, a real one doesn't have rubber on the case, and it doesn't have any rubber on the uh, band itself. Uh, it'll never have a skeleton display where you can see the inner workings, the windings and gears of the, of the watch itself. Uh, it'll... it'll uh, It'll never have chrome or chrome plating on the watch itself. And it went through, there were a bunch of more, the secondhand things like that, and I thought that was kind of interesting. What I found was there was one tip that, to me, I thought was probably one that should have been in there, and it wasn't in, in, in any of the articles I read, really. And I think, to me, this would be the most telling. You know which one? You know what tip might be that, that might be? How much does it cost? <laughs> Right? So if you go down to New York City and you get a Rolex watch off the streets of New York City for 20 bucks, yeah, that's probably not real. <laughs> uh, real Rolex watches, they're thousands of dollars, right? Depending on what you want and that kind of thing. Thousands of dollars. To me, the cost, the cost says a lot about the authenticity, right? Now, I've given you 10 tips how to spot a doctrinally pure church this morning. Ten tips. One thing I kind of hinted at but didn't come out and say was the cost. I don't really talk about the cost. And, and, And the cost, again, to me, it says a lot about the authenticity. What did it cost Jesus? His life on a cross. That's the first cost. You know what the second cost is? It costs us to follow him, right? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross daily. There's a cost involved to follow him. So when you responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, let me ask, did it cost you anything? Some of you, yeah, oh man, my friends changed. Uh, It cost me a bunch of stuff. The way I live my life, a lot of things. But let me, if, you, if all you did was raise a hand or sign a card or complete a membership class, but you never really surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, to surrender, take, took up your cross, then I think it's time that you respond to the true gospel of Jesus. Now we're going to sing here in a moment. If you haven't done that, I invite you to do it today. To give it all to Jesus Christ. Come forward during this song. Meet me down here in front. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Give Him your life. Repent of your ways. Turn around and start doing the right thing, doing what Jesus wants you to do rather than the world tells you to do. Get baptized so that Jesus can wash away your sins and you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so you can live for Him every day. That's real response to a doctrinally pure gospel. I invite you to do that today. Let's stand and let's sing. If that's you, I invite you to come down and meet me here.